Good morning, friends. It's uh, great to be together, even if over the internet. We give thanks for the blessings of spring. It's warming up. And uh, the blessings of being able to get out a bit more. I bet some of you this week on Saturday were out golf. And that's just what I kind of figure. But uh, out walking, being careful, but enjoying the sunshine. And so we gather in spiritual community to heighten our awareness of that sunshine, of that light that's with us, that sees us through. And so we're going to start with a Van Morrison song that talks about that light. Whenever God shines his light on me, and God's going to shine that light today. Shines a light on me, opens up my eyes so I can see. When I look up in the darkest night, I know everything's gonna be alright. In deep confusion, in great despair, when I reach out for Him, He is there. When I am lonely, Know that God shines His light on me. Reach out for Him, He'll be there. With Him, your troubles you can share. If you live the life you love, you'll get the blessing from above. He heals the sick and He heals the lame. Says you can do it too in Jesus' name. He'll lift you up and he'll turn you around. And he'll put your feet back on higher ground. Mm -hmm. Surely share. You can use use his higher power in every day and every hour. He heals the sick and he heals the lame. Says you can do it too in Jesus' name. He'll lift you up and he'll turn you around and put your feet back. On higher ground. All right, and join with us in singing this next song. There's a part for you. Just keep singing that. Lean in. Just 
side shifts the balance toward the light. Water's winding open wide, leaning towards the light. Don't just walk when you can fly, leaning towards the light. When justice seems in short supply, leaning towards the light. The beauty be your truest sky. Leaning toward the light The shadows of this world will say There's no hope why I try anyway But every kindness, large or slight Shifts the balance towards the light Prayer I pray at even time Leaning toward the light All left undone be put aside Leaning toward the light When forgiveness is hard to find Leaning toward the light Help me at least to be kind Leaning toward the light Leaning toward the light Leaning toward the light with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them up to God let us give thanks to God it is right to give God thanks and praise <clears throat> together we say our Bible verse second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 God did, did not give, give us a spirit, spirit of fear but rather a spirit of power love and self-control and our opening hymn Thine be the glory. you roll stones away and take the tombs of our lives in this world and you open them wide with the dawn comes healing and a new creation let our celebration today empty our tombs renew our lives and release your power of love 
Through the risen Christ we pray, and we pray to you as our mother and as our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right. It's community time. All right. Let's see, I got a slide that made me chuckle, so I thought I'd share with you. Pete keep asking, is COVID-19 really that serious? Listen up. Casinos and churches are closed. When heaven and hell agree on the same thing, <laughs> it's probably pretty serious. <laughs> and we got some signs of spring here. Here's uh, some parents and their kids uh, playing in the pond. That's pretty cool. And some flowers. The flowers are out. They're so beautiful. And there we go. And the trees are just coming alive. So, you know, uh, I want to invite you. Like, don't take this for granted. These are the real miracles of life. I mean, go look at a flower this week and, and look at it in the detail of it. And don't stop looking until you're amazed. Okay? I want us to live lives of amazement and awe at how nature just functions around us. It, it's amazing. All right. We've got a... Happy anniversary going out to Bonnie and Bob Major. And you're celebrating your 50th anniversary. It was last week, I believe. So we just celebrate with you. We're glad the two of you found each other and that you're doing good. And then we got some birthdays. Got a number of birthdays. We got a birthday thing up there. There we go. Happy birthday. So Helen Bell from Trinity is celebrating her birthday on Monday. So happy birthday, Helen. And Edith Mathers from Trinity is celebrating hers on Tuesday. So happy birthday, Edith. And Orpha Frank at Mount Zion is celebrating her 90th birthday on May the 19th. So that's Tuesday too. So uh, that's fantastic. And Orpha, I mean, you don't look a day over 75, honestly. You just <laughs> blow me away. And then Brian is having a birthday on uh, the 22nd. So happy birthday, Brian. And he also has a prayer request we'll get to in just a second. By the way, this is your last chance for a free big chest freezer that works. So uh, let us know if you want that. Now, uh, Andrew, who sings in the choir at Trinity, is helping a homeless man and uh, include getting some mats from Jerry and Beth so he doesn't have to uh, sleep in the ground. But uh, this homeless fella needs some size six men's boots. Size six men's boots in good condition. So if you have a pair to give away, let me know by email or phone or phone Trinity. And uh, we'll pick them up and get them to Andrew so he can get them to his homeless friend. And then uh, good news. Let's see. Let's go to another slide there. There's uh, Millie and Nolan. And uh, they're at the garden there. And uh, great news from the garden. All 13 plots have been signed up for, and seven of the plots are families with children involved. And that's so great because as children really get to see the amazing generosity and faithfulness of nature, then not only do they grow the garden, but the garden grows them. And uh, of the 13 plots, there are six going to community folks who really don't know Mount Zion. And they're going to get to know Mount Zion and fall in love with us because we just love them. And that's the joy of it. And Mark is going to install a tap on the church, on the wall by the garden, so people don't have to bring buckets. And there'll be a special key so kids can't turn it on, leave it on at night, and create a flood in the basement. And uh, so that'll be really cool. So we thank you, Mark, for that. Now we do have some prayer requests. Uh, I want to just mention, uh, some years ago when Susan Cole was here as an intern, she got a prayer chain going. And uh, Marcy Atkinson and Kathy Trulove would like to start that up again. 
So if you'd be willing to be on the prayer chain, which would mean someone would call you with a prayer request, you'd pray about it, and then phone the next person in the chain. And that way it would have a, a whole circle of people caring about people and praying for people. So just let us know if you want to be on that uh, prayer chain, and, uh, and uh, we'll uh, make sure that uh, Kathy and uh, Marcy get you set up there. Uh, good news, Linda Black is coming, home, coming along after her operation, so we give thanks for that and Charlie's happiness over that. And let's keep Jim and Helen Irwin in our prayers. I heard that Mary Stratton's not doing well and is in the hospital, so let's keep her and, and her family and friends in our prayers. And then we have some deaths. Allie Wells, she's our bookkeeper, but she comes to church here with her son Cameron. Her grandmother passed away. Uh, it was a good passing, and she was elderly, but uh, she was a great woman. Allie writes, uh, she was always an inspiration to me. She served as a nurse in the front lines during the Second World War, where she met her future husband when he came into the hospital full of shrapnel. They immigrated to Canada and started over with a young child. She became a widow and has been living on her own in their family home out in the country for 30 years. She's always been the definition of courage and grace to me. And then I have a picture. This is Amanda Rowe, which both churches know because she volunteers to sing from time to time, and her dad. Her dad, Dr. David John Rowe, uh, passed away on May the 8th. He was 84. Uh, he suffered from aggressive cancer. And Amanda writes, cherished memories are preserved in our hearts of this loving, kind, positive, and playful spirit. An enormous legacy of worldwide recognition and unquestionably one of the great mathematical physicists spanning the last 45 years. This humble and modest nuclear physicist recently published likely his most important work. Isn't that cool at 84? He is unequivocally an intellectual giant, and his keen intellect is only surpassed by the love and generosity shown to his family and friends. Love you forever, Daddy O, and hope you are happily floating somewhere right now, dreaming of mathematical equations. And for Mount Zion, Connie Simple has passed away, a longtime member, just a dear woman with a great spirit to her. She's been suffering in Parkwood Hospital, well, for since January. And so she had a peaceful passing with members of her family with her. She was 99. So there'll be a private graveside service. And then we're going to have a memorial service later to celebrate her life together. And that'll be wonderful. And then we have a prayer request from Brian. The director of Participation House that oversees the group homes. Her name is Carmel Tate died suddenly at age 53. Now, Brian's known her for many years. She was the one who enabled him to be moved out of Toronto to the great home that he's at here in London. And so uh, he's sad, as are uh, many of the people in that agency, and, uh, and of course, her family. So let's keep all of them in our prayers. I think that's all our announcements, but uh, <coughs> We give thanks that we have communities that care for one another, and we thank you for your donations. And uh, those of you who are up against it financially, don't you worry. Uh, God will see you through. And God will see uh, Trinity and Mount Zion through, because others step up to the plate. So we thank you for that, and we celebrate with an old gospel song that Shelley's going to sing called, I'm Sheltered Safe in the Arms of God.
So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise. They don't worry me, for I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. He walks with me, and not of earth shall harm me. For I'm sheltered in the arms of God. Soon I shall hear the call from heaven's portals. Come home, my child, it's the last mile you must draw. chapter 17. Paul stood up in front of the city council and said, I see that in every way you Athenians are religious. For as I walked through your city and looked at the places where you worship, I found an altar on which is written, to an unknown God, that which you worship then, even though you do not know it is, even though you do not know it, is what I know now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples made by human hands. Nor does God need anything that we can supply by working for her, since it is she herself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. From one human being, he created all races of people and made them to live throughout the whole earth. Himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of places where they would live. She did this so that they would look for her and perhaps find her as they felt around for God. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. As someone has said, in God we live and move and exist. It is 
as some of our poets have said, we too are God's children. Since we are God's children, we should not suppose that his nature is anything like the image of gold or silver or stone shaped by human art and skill. God has overlooked this time when people did not know better, but now commands all of them everywhere to turn away from their evil ways. For the whole world will be judged with justice by means of someone God has chosen. God has given proof of this to everyone by raising that someone from death. May we discover a word of God for us in these words of scripture. The universe is not inert. The universe is not a dead thing. The universe is filled with energies we can't even begin to imagine. And oh, we see the beauty of those energies on planet Earth. So Allison's going to sing about this now as she sings all the colors of the wind.
Thank you, Elvis. Please pray with me. Spirit of wisdom, of love, of justice, minister to us, your people. May only truth be spoken and may only truth be heard, we ask. Amen. One of my favorite magazines is The Atlantic. It's, I think, the longest running magazine in the United States, started by some of the framers of the Constitution, so that goes back a while. And it's scholarly and factual and uh, very uh, informative. The cover article two editions ago was on the nuclear family and how that's not working so well because children need more than two parents and many only have one. And uh, the article in this last edition is the main the cover article is The Anxious Child and the Crisis of Modern Parenting. Imagine for a moment that the future is going to be even more stressful than the present. I mean, maybe we don't need to imagine it. Many people probably believe this will be so. So it's sobering to realize that since the 1990s, the middle of the 1990s, our children have already been getting more and more stressed than at any other time since we've been recording these things. Now, it's ironic because no children have received more attention than children who've been born since the mid-1990s, but they're getting more stressed all the time and their parents are getting stressed with them. The rates of adolescent depression from the mid-90s started rising and has risen ever since. Suicides have overtaken homicides as the second most common cause of death in 10 to 24 year olds, with only accidents being higher. In the United States, the children's emergency room visits for suicides attempts um, have risen from 600,000 in a year in 2007 to a million point one in 2015. And 43% of these visits around attempted suicide and suicide ideation, children planning on how they will kill themselves. 43% of these visits were with children younger than 11 years of age. Very sobering. And in London, both Fanshawe College and Western have doubled the amount of therapists on staff to meet the demands of their students. And they do a great job. But researchers are trying to figure out how we can flatten the curve. We know that term now. Flatten the curve of anxiety in society and start things moving back in the other direction to more historical norms. I mean, it's not that in the past we haven't had things to worry about. A friend of mine sent me a reflection that reminds us of what our grandparents and great-grandparents went through. It offers some perspective. Imagine you were born in 1900. On your 14th birthday, World War I starts and ends on your 18th birthday. 22 million people perish in that war. Later in the same year, a Spanish flu epidemic hits the planet and runs until your 20th birthday, killing 50 million people in those two years. 50 million in two years. On your 29th birthday, the Great Depression begins. Unemployment hits 25%, and the world GDP drops 27%. And that goes on until you're 33. And the country nearly collapses along with the world economy. When you turn 39, the Second World War breaks out. You aren't even over the hill yet, and don't try to catch your breath. On your 41st birthday, the United States is fully pulled into World War II, and between your 39th and 45th birthday, 75 million people perish in the war. Smallpox was an epidemic until you're in your 40s. 
as it has killed 300 million people during your lifetime. At 50, the Korean War starts, 5 million more people perish. From your birth until you are 55, you've dwelt with the fear of polio epidemics each summer. You experience friends and family contracting polio and being paralyzed or dying. At 55, the Vietnam War begins and doesn't end for 20 years. Four million people perish in that conflict. During the Cold War, you lived every day with the fear of nuclear war. On your 62nd birthday, there is the Cuban Missile Crisis, a tipping point where life on our planet as we know it feels like it could come to an end. And when you turn 75, the Vietnam War finally ends. How's that for a lifetime of facing challenges? I mean, I'm just blown away by the generations that went through all that. People have always had to worry about things, particularly worry about evil in all its forms and worry about natural disasters. Now, we know that greed and money and power has been a part of every empire, including the American empire. But it's on full display today as a psychotic president who flaunts this fact instead of hiding it. We see the real underbelly of empire in the Trump presidency. Evil in its more insidious and systemic forms is also becoming unmasked as we discover that our economic systems are a death engine to Mother Earth and ourselves as global warming and the destruction of our soil, water, and air compromises our ability to exist. And we see how evil can take us over individually. We all know that we can lose ourselves to powers of addiction. We can lose ourselves to powers of pain and fear and anger that it can erupt in, well, acts of violence like the 22 people killed in Nova Scotia. Turns out he was angry, an angry, angry, violent man who beat up his partner many times and unfortunately, the RCMP didn't respond. Uh, their neighbor called the RCMP and they said, you need collaboration before we can come. In fact, when the neighbors moved in next door, that man actually showed them weapons that they knew were restricted because they were military people and he was looking for ammunition for them and they told the RCMP and it wasn't followed up. But, but evil can take us over. And evil is something, therefore, we have to be aware of and be careful not to fall into. It visits us. And there's always the temptation for pain to move us from hope to despair and from love to revenge. The other thing humans have always had to worry about are natural disasters, what we used to call acts of God. Until we figured out that if God had the power to cause floods and pandemics, then God must have the power to stop them. And since God doesn't stop them, God either does not exist or is evil or doesn't have that power. Science has helped us to figure out how pandemics and floods and earthquakes and forest fires happen. And true spirituality needs science to keep it honest about the reality the nature of reality in God. Just as good science needs a robust spirituality to discern what is ethical and meaningful. Religion often makes the mistake of inventing a God and imbuing it with a power that it doesn't have. A power that religion says belongs to its tribe. And so if we do this, if we come together with our God, we'll be more powerful than the other tribes with their inferior God. And there's a lot of that in the Bible, too. We think of players in a championship game with players on each team praying to their God that God will help them win. Now, the people in Athens that Paul was visiting were more astute than most. They were sophisticated. They were rich in the arts and in religion and philosophy. They built temples to every religion they knew the god of every religion they knew. They wanted to cover every base. And they even built a temple to the unknown god in case there was one they hadn't found out about yet. So Paul uses this as a way of having discourse with them. Uh, they must have heard about him because they let him come to the city council and have a conversation. And uh, 
and, and, and so uh, Paul says, good for you having a temple to the unknown God because that's the mystery that I worship. Let me tell you about the unknown God. He says, any God can't be captured in physical material ways. Idols, all the different ways that we try to put our faith in things that have no power for us. God's, Paul says, God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. Nor does God need anything we can supply for her since it is she herself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. Paul says, while God is not definable and can't be controlled and can't be put in any image, God is present and is part of us and is a part of everything in the universe. We are all God's children, Paul says. What a revolutionary concept back in that time. I mean, it's revolutionary enough now with different religions still saying that they're the ones who have God's children. We're all God's children, Paul said, whatever our tribe. In God we live, move, and have our being. One of my favorite verses. We don't need a superhero God with special powers that can override the laws of nature because let's face it, if the miracle stories in the Bible were factual, instead of symbolic attention grabbers, they haven't done anything for you or me. They haven't done anything because we've never seen the physical laws of nature set aside. We don't see people being raised physically from the dead. Nobody's walking on water. Nobody's having their schizophrenia cured by prayer, faith healers, or gurus of any kind. I watched The Shack again. It's on Netflix. <laughs> I'm watching more Netflix than I usually do. And uh, it's a great movie in many ways. I enjoyed the movie more than the book. For those who don't know The Shack, it's a fascinating story about God working to help a hurt man work through his anger at God for letting his father beat his mother and for letting his daughter get kidnapped and murdered. I like the movie better than the book because the movie emphasizes more the idea of God with us, struggling alongside of us, working to heal and mitigate the damage done and bring redemption and new life out of evil and death. But the book and the movie can't let go of a God who has power over nature, able to walk on water, do as God likes, knows everything that's going to happen, knows what we're going to say. That God leaves me cold. It's no help to me facing life's unbearable burdens. That God is an idol, a parlor trick, a disappointment. God understands. I mean, Paul understands God as the creative, loving beingness that animates all of life and love in the universe. Not as some being apart from the universe. God isn't someone over us. God is with us. God is the system, not over the system. God is the universe evolving it, moving it toward greater life, more complex life, greater diversity, greater relationships, greater human rights, greater kindness. Paul identifies the desire for relationship as essential to this mystery we call God. He says, God created and is creating so that humanity will look for God and find her as they feel around for God. We all have that desire in us to be connected to the whole. We are all relational in our very essence. The universe is one intricate set of relationships. The universe is one organism, one being that we're all a part of, just as we Christians say that we're all a part of the body of Christ. The universe is the body of God. Every part connected and interacting with the other. This was the gift from the Jews who called God. <sighs> they understood God was spirit and energy, mysteriously at work everywhere, denoting that God, or the other name they had for God, I am who I will be. And understanding that God, too, is evolving with the universe. You know, even science didn't believe in an evolving, growing universe until a Belgian priest by the name of George Limitri used Einstein's E equals MC squared to assert the Big Bang Theory 
and the growth of an expanding universe. Even though his equations were correct, even though Einstein couldn't believe it, until later an astronomer named Hubble proved it. Some of the ancients, though, had a sense of how we're all connected into one being, into one life force. In the first creation story, God does not create out of nothing, like I was taught. If you read it, it says, in the beginning, as God was creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void and darkness was everywhere. An early insight into the Big Bang that takes chaos seriously and envisions God as the spirit that evolves order and life out of chaos. That's important. Because unless we embrace chaos, we'll always be thrown off stride when chaos slaps us in the face. When chaos hits us, we have to know that it's not that God has abandoned us. We have to know that chaos is a part of existence that God cannot eliminate. That God, like us, is working through to bring something new, to bring into harmony. The second creation story also points out that creation's difficult and it envisions God down in the dirt creating a human being. And the Jewish faith saw that this ability for the universe to evolve and create life was a divine principle that can give us comfort and faith and hope. They also saw that our capacity to love and our need for relationship is the other great divine principle. And the core affirmation of our capacity to love and forgive. The Bible writers had God's first question in the Bible be a question of relationship. They picture God walking in the garden say, Adam, where are you? I haven't seen you. I'm missing you. They understood that relationship is core to this mystery, this divine mystery we call God. And so we see that God is vulnerable to the pain that evil causes as we are vulnerable. God shared the pain of Jesus dying on the cross. God shares the pain of all who are hurt. Now that's a God I can get my head around and trust. A force that's subject to the same realities as you and me, experiencing chaos and pain, yet always seeking life and love and growth like we do. For we're a part of the divine mystery. No tricks or escape from reality are needed or possible. Life is eternal. Great miracles like forgiveness and awareness and redemption happen all the time. These are the real miracles, just like our ability to eat sunlight and soil and rainwater in the food that we take in. These are miracles we can trust our lives to. But there's one last miracle that Paul mentions that is core to what he experiences and history experiences as the divine presence. He observes that God is in the business of creating justice just as much as creating life and love. He says, God overlooked the times when we had not evolved enough to know right from wrong, but now commands all people to turn from their evil ways. For the whole world will be judged with justice by someone God has chosen. God has given proof to this by raising that one from death, referring to of course, to Jesus. Paul's expressing his profound belief that in this world, nobody gets away with anything. It's not that God decides who should and shouldn't be punished. It's that everything that's destructive to life and love and meaning, the system breaks it down. The system will not let it grow. The system will not let it flourish. Paul made clear that God blesses love and overturns evil. To the extent that people do not live in the Jesus way of kindness, respect, and love, they'll suffer for it. Just as plants can't grow and flourish without sunlight, water, and minerals, so we can't grow and flourish without kindness, respect, and fairness. Cruel people are not happy people. Driven people with no empathy are not happy people. Greedy people are not happy people. And if there's one thing history teaches, it's that people with guns and money don't win in the end. The arc of history leans toward greater human rights. Thank God. 
<laughs> we dare not leave our decision making up to others because if we make decisions that are harmful to the universe, the immune system of the universe, which is my model of what the judgment of God is, the immune system of the universe breaks down everything physically and spiritually that's harmful to health. Karma is no respecter of persons. We sow what we reap. It may take some time to enjoy the crop, but we reap what we sow. The article on the anxious child highlights that the best thing we can do for our children is not to try and make their lives easier and take away their insecurities and anxieties, but to coach them through it. To acknowledge that that test they're going to start study is, is stressful, it is a challenge but that they just have to do their best. And the results don't matter, because if they do their best and are kind, they're going to have great lives. Isn't that reassuring? Instead of competitive messages, oh, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. If you don't get the right mark, things aren't going to work out, you're not going to get a job. It just kills kids. And then the article from two months ago, the researchers point out, instead of a family of just a parent or two, we need community. It's the people who are part of big extended families that are all working together well. It's, it's people who are in villages of spiritual communities that are kind and cultural communities that are kind. These are the families where the kids and the grandkids do better. Yes, that mysterious unknown force that's in us and a part of us. That's what we need to be telling our kids about and connecting it to nature, connecting it to science so that they see the whole universe is designed for love, is designed for greater relationship and complexity, and is designed for justice. What a difference it would make in our kids' lives if they grew up hearing that all the time and that reinforced. The whole universe is your friend. Ah, yes. We give thanks for that mysterious unknown God that enables the universe to grow into more life, into more love, more justice for all, will enable us to weather the storms of chaos and evil together, will see us through as it saw our ancestors through. My friends, that's the good news. That's the gospel. Allison's going to sing about that now for our prayer time with a beautiful chorus, I Am Not Alone. And uh, so I invite you to, to take this as a moment to reflect and contemplate. To give thanks that the mercies of God are new every morning. Yes, the chaos comes. The pain can be intense. But we're not alone. Life and love will see us through. And so let's turn all our cares into the keeping of the universe that partners with us that sees us through. Breaking 
thanks, O oh Spirit, that we are not alone. We live, move together with you in our shared universe. Amen. All right, our final hymn is a hymn that's an old hymn tune, but uh, with newer words, great words. It's a hymn called, We Meet You, O Christ. join God in the family business of bringing harmony out of chaos, of bringing life and love to all we do, and of living for justice, living in kindness, respect, and fairness. And may the blessing of the source of all things, of Jesus Christ, that source of love revealed in the Holy Spirit, love's power in us, be with us this day and every day of our lives, world without end. Amen. We're going to finish with a chorus called, Oh Mary, Don't You Weep, Don't Mourn, talks about how there's that immune system in the universe that tears down evil. So when we've got a challenge to face, let's face it uh, with that feeling. Don't weep, don't mourn, Pharaoh's army got drowned, and whatever army we got to face, it'll get drowned too. Oh Mary, don't you weep, don't mourn. 